Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to this fully booked London ACES Hub hosted webinar on trauma-informed system change, best practice and lived experience into action. I'm Elena Alexandru, London ACES Hub member, consultant clinical psychologist working primarily in the London Borough of Hackney and more recently within staff wellbeing in the NHS in Oxfordshire. We're aware that our community tonight has people located all over the UK and beyond. Feel free to say hello in the chat, tell us where you're watching from and what you'd like to take home from this evening's webinar. We'd love to hear from you. We've three fantastic guest speakers for you this evening, Angela, Mina and Victoria, and welcome to them. My co-facilitator this evening is Derek Williams, fellow LA member, ex-boxing champion and well-being practitioner. Well, thank you, Eleanor, and hello to everyone. Well, I'm happy to be here again, super excited. It's back again. It's been a year since our last event at the London Aces Hub, and um, you can still see our attachment and culturally competent practice. If you go to the U LA YouTube channel, you can still you can still get it. So, um, and I won't keep you too long. I'll join you back later to answer some questions and help facilitate. So I'll pass on to Eleanor. Thank you. You can watch all of our other webinars, racial justice, etc., on there as well, um, on the ACES Hub YouTube channel. Thanks very much, Derek. I'd now like to invite Simon Partridge, one of the consultant directors of the London ACES Hub, an expert by experience and an advocate of ACES and trauma-informed care awareness for a welcoming note. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Uh, it's my honour and pleasure um, to be with you this evening long, alongside our inspiring colleagues with a wealth of experience in trauma-informed system transformation. And we now need this more than ever given all our problems. I'd also like to say hello to 500 plus people who put into this virtual space. This is beyond my wildest dreams. It's a great omen for what I know will be a stimulating webinar with a nice surprise at the end. So stay tuned. No wonder I'm smiling. So over to our lovely hosts, Eleanor and Derek. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Our three speakers this evening have a commitment to sharing the important knowledge and learning from their lived experiences and work in this area to date. The challenges we face in our communities and workplaces show the need for more trauma-informed relationships and services. Our hope is that this webinar contributes to enabling creative thinking and action in applying this knowledge to build healthier communities and workforces in London and beyond. We also want to share with you how you can contribute your own trauma-informed projects and good practice examples to keep building this movement. We have time in the programme to connect and hear from the community that are here this evening, share insights and respectfully debate together. And we're aware that many in our audience are well-versed in this topic already. Each of our speakers will present, followed by a brief Q&A, Please use the Q&A section to submit your questions and post comments in the chat. Make sure you select all participants and panelists if you'd like to share your comment with everyone. Derek will be keeping an eye on the chat and the Q&A. Please note the event will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel and website. If you'd like to remain anonymous, feel welcome to change your details via the name function on Zoom. For some of us, the conversation about trauma this evening may bring up memories that might be disturbing. We want to make sure that the experience is positive and constructive for all of us. So if you have painful memories or any moments, we'll understand if you wish to pause and step back before returning. Now, time to hear from our special guests. And we're just going to um, change the order a bit to the one on the programme as Angela's not been able to join us yet. Um, so we're going to be starting this evening with um, a presentation from Mina Hadi, journalist, service user and lived experience trainer who will talk about 
the importance of lived experience in transforming mental health systems. Thank you, Elena, um, for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm just getting my presentation up. So, yeah, my name is Mina. I, um, as Elena was saying, I wear many hats and um, doing many roles within uh, the East London uh, Foundation Trust, which is also where uh, I met Elena and have been working with her. Um, and I'm going to be sharing a bit about the importance of lived experience in transforming mental health systems. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a journalist. I have had bylines in the Hackney Gazette and in the Independent. I have more uh, articles in the pipeline as well. So writing is a real passion for me and has always been. I'm also a service user having used uh, mental health services for around 10 years. So since I was about 16. And I've also delivered many trauma informed care training sessions to mental health professionals over the past couple of years as part of the community mental health transformation program that is um, being run in, in ELFT. Um, I've been a researcher for a cultural competence project known as the PCREF, the Patient and Carers Race Equality Framework. I've uh, been consulted in forming the Complex Emotional Needs Pathway within ELFT, um, which is another term for um, personality disorders. And importantly, I think it's really, really vital to consider someone's demographic when you're thinking about being more trauma informed. And to that end, um, I am visibly Muslim. I'm British Bangladeshi and have been living in Newham for most of my life. Um, and so just keep that in mind as we go through today, like uh, what I'm going to be sharing in terms of lived experience. Um, some of my articles include this one about me having borderline personality disorder. Um, you are probably at least tangentially familiar with the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial that happened a little while ago and the diagnosis and I say that in quote marks because it wasn't really a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder which was kind of weaponized against um, Amber Heard and, and I wrote about that and I think it's important to consider the stories that you can tell in terms of mental health and how that can impact um, you know, the, the attitudes that people have towards certain diagnoses, the stigma that's attached uh, to this day to personality disorders. Um, I've also written a blog about trauma and how it can be quite political, especially for minorities, um, for many, many minoritized groups. Um, and then a bit more about the PCREF, the Patient and Carer Race Equality Framework, which um, was being piloted in East London Foundation Trust, um, and about basically the importance of cultural competence. And um, cultural competence and trauma-informed care, I think, go hand in hand, and they always have been. Um, so I wrote a little bit in the Hackney Gazette about that. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of share a bit about how trauma-informed care has been received by uh, healthcare professionals. So, and, and also sort of what went well, because that's an important element of uh, thinking about how to be more trauma-informed. Uh, so I had more confidence being around clinical professionals. Um, I'm actually like really introverted and I often struggle to, you know, uh, carry conversations but I found that this was a really great way of uh, interacting with people um, but also in terms of my professional development you know I I have a law degree so I was able to use bits of my sort of um, expertise in that sense um, and there's a sense of empowerment that can come from genuine co-production so not co-production in this tokenistic way and when I say co-production I mean leaning on lived experience as well as um, you know academic or professional experience in in forming a service um, so I think it's really really important to consider 
feeling like you're on an equal footing with someone. Um, and I co-delivered this trauma-informed care training with, um, with Elena in Hackney. And I found that I was treated as an equal. And I think that's a really, really important element of it. Even though I'm not a clinical um, person, I don't have any clinical qualifications. There's a qualification in the fact that I have accessed these services and have come across these barriers. Um, and so I'm an expert in my own right. And sharing the, that lived experience on my terms, taking control of my narrative has been uh, really empowering for me personally. There's also a sense of leadership, I think, when it comes to sharing lived experience. So I've talked about my journey in accessing mental health services, um, about going to a GP, having my confidentiality breached and all of these quite difficult, maybe vulnerable situations, but I share them on my terms. And I think that's an important element of uh, sharing lived experience. I would also say, yeah, there's something around the fact that I got a sense of leadership from this because I would be co-facilitating breakout rooms and I would be, uh, you know, a lot of people were quite quiet. So I'm quite good at nudging people to speak and have a conversation. So in all those senses, th those were all really great things about um, me sort of sharing my lived experience, co-delivering, co-facilitating, co-designing uh, trauma-informed care training. But there were also a lot of barriers. There's a lack of cultural competence that comes from perhaps a sense of services, um, you know, labelling certain groups as being hard to reach rather than the services themselves being inaccessible. So I was talking about the feedback that I was getting from staff on uh, the trauma-informed care training and the fact that it was being uh, facilitated by not just um, clinical staff, but also uh, service users like myself. And people were saying that hearing me speak made them feel safe. And I think that's really important because safety is a big element of trauma-informed care. And it's also about the fact that I was building a narrative about my life and uh, the struggles that I had when I was, um, you know, trying to access services, the problems that I faced, the fact that it was not a very easy experience for me. Um, the stigma from, the, from you know, my, my culture and my family all of those things really played into uh, my story and the way that I told it was, uh, you know, someone said that it was engaging, especially when I was talking about the power imbalance. You know, I'm, I often feel like when, when clinical staff see me, they just see uh, my diagnoses. They see someone with OCD and BPD and depression, and anxiety. They don't see the whole person. They don't see the journalist, they don't see the Bengali woman, Muslim woman who has a faith base and that is a source of strength for her. They don't see the writer. So I think it's really important to consider like personal experiences and try and build that picture with, with your client. And then, yeah, I was just uh, doing a quick self-promotion um, for Twitter, I am on Twitter, Jano Mia, Mina, and um, if you wanted to read any of my, any of my work, you can uh, scan the QR code or uh, follow the link, which I can put in the chat as well. So yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, trauma form is about acceptance. And you Sorry. know, and trying to find. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Victoria. I am an independent mental health advisor with lived experience, and I joined the London Aces Hub actually from day one, exactly back in I think it was 2018. And thank you so much to Tiane and Simon to give me this amazing, amazing opportunity. But then I just want 
before I start my talk, I just want to dedicate this talk uh, to the 3,000 people I've been speaking to, children, young adults, elderly people, and the 200 services that I've been inspecting or reviewing so far. And I just want to say thanks to them for motivating me to keep on going, questioning, challenging, advising throughout the UK, despite sometimes it can get really hard to bear. But my aim is to really make a difference, you know, for the sake of humans' dignity of life. And this lies really here at the center of, of my life. So as I said, um, I want to open my talk by saying how grateful, honored, and humble I am to be involved in this evening's webinar and to be part of such an inspiring panel. The theme we are proposing this evening needs attention, but most importantly, needs action. So let's make sure that it will have a ripple effect. Let's use this webinar as a starting point, as a platform for where each of us can create a change and be the change. I experience multiple traumas in life in different shapes at different times. Self-loathing was my anchor, an underlying feeling of constantly finding fault with myself and putting myself down. I deserve nothing better. And so throughout my life, I continually searched and settled for unhappy and unhealthy relationships. This led me to experience very challenging and difficult circumstances where often my life was at danger. My breakthrough came when I revisited my life story through my personal narrative. It's called inclusive life history research. It enabled me to recall, record and reflect on the life events the outcomes, the touch points, I finally became expert of my own life. Visiting my past shaped and amended the perspectives I had about myself, but I also understood how I was perceived by others. I was able to feel my life, understanding what I was going through. Finally, I was in charge of my life and I was sitting in the driver's seat. All the adversities became a driving force for achieving my mission, encouraging others to tap into their inner potential, inspiring them through my own life experiences and be the voice to those who don't have a voice. Since summer 2015, I've become an independent mental health advisor with lived experience and an active leader of co-production in Northwest London area. Working with the Northwest London Mental Health and Learning Disability Board with the local NHS Trust, but I do some work also for the CQC and the Royal uh, College of Psychiatrists. I started hearing about trauma-informed care back in 2017. I still remember how intrigued I was after I understood its principles. Deep down, it was like if I found the key to sort out the pieces of my jigsaw called life. Each long-standing unanswered question was, finding, final, was finally finding a response. I still remember how excited I was when back in 2018, I registered to attend the first conference related to trauma from care and practices organized by East London University by Professor John Reed. Angela was there as a speaker too. I could relate to everything that was said. It inspired me to act. What happened after the conference? I started searching for deepening my knowledge on trauma informed care. And I began to inspire and encourage every single service I met to adapt to the model. 
not an easy task though. In the meantime, something kept on going into my head, asking myself, what if I was asked the question, what happened to you? Why do we do the things we do? Why are we the way we are? Is there a way to provide us a roadmap for repairing relationships, overcoming what seems insurmountable and ultimately living better and more fulfilling lives? Yes, there is. It's the way we approach each other that needs change, especially towards those who struggle or show to have challenging behaviors. Behind each of us, there is a story. Often, we may find it difficult to express our feelings, ask for help, communicate what we are going through. I remember the time I was struggling the most. The only way I was communicating my discomfort was approaching and reacting to people in a, in a rude and utterly unkind way for no reason. In return, there was judgment, criticism, and abandonment. The last NHS long-term plan talks about trauma-informed care. Services throughout the country are becoming finally familiar with the terminology, but have they really understood what it entails? The misuse of the word trauma, too complex to be managed. But trauma is the impact of each individual's life experiences. Every one of us is so different, and so are the different reactions. It is difficult to size and detect trauma. And if no one addresses their own experiences, both past and present, in relation to their behavior, it can lead to a lack of understanding a further risk for everyone involved staff working within health and social care too. Our system still approaches mental ill health with a medical model that tries to remedy effects or symptoms without dealing with causes. A concept of cure rather than an approach of care. What you hear is only about patient flow, bed management, medication review, mental health act detention, restrictive practices, complex needs, restraint, seclusion, locked doors, and bunches of keys for closing and opening locked doors. We don't rather look at the individual's life, but at the disorder, the condition, at the problem, at the effects, at the outcome. I often sit on interviews panels, and I usually provide a couple of questions. One of my favorites is about compassion. Candidates struggle. They struggle to respond. How do we define compassion? Compassion is when we feel the sufferings of others as our own. It is when we have the desire to save them. To relieve another person of suffering we must identify with that person and share their suffering. Compassion is when we see each other as equals, when we tell the person in front of us, I see you, I hear you. When I am on an inspection, a review, or when I interview a patient or a carer, I hear a lot about the use of restraint and seclusions and seclusion. Standards are there to protect the patient, but how can we define a system that still relies on the use of restrictive practice, or restrictive practice, locked doors, no access to fresh air? What about the big and gaping hole already existing in our lives? We need to create a system based on the rights of the people who need help. We need to focus on the person over the illness a system based on the dignity and respect of life. We must give people necessary support to rebuild their lives and lift their hope through encouragement of healthy minds and healthy bodies. We need to learn about the art of listening. It requires practice, skill, spirit, 
and inspiration. It requires the whole you with your ears, your body, your mind, and most importantly, your heart. I care for you rather than judging you and assessing you and giving you a diagnosis. Every single individual has the capacity and potential to overcome a difficulty, live a life of value and influence positively the community at a local and global level. This is what I'm trying to do since I have embarked on my new journey, which I call my mission. For women, CIC happens to be robust evidence, a compassionate approach where I listen, acknowledge, validate, respond, are the core of whatever I do. By offering a safe and non-judgmental platform, I create trust and build on relationships bond that enable women to tap into their potential and focus on their strengths and resilience. Through the process of psychosocial resilience, we champion and celebrate social connectedness, self-empowerment through self-awareness. And I would like to end with this. Each of us has the ability to discover the art of living and to find its meaning and purpose. In the process of healing ourselves from being ill, inadequate and challenging, our life state of mind can shift. What seemed to limit us for some times can fall away, allowing us to live more deeply, fully and passionately than ever done. The art of living is closely tied to our ability to recognize the meaning in our lives and enjoy it to the fullest, no matter what. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Victoria. And I didn't get a chance to say before you started your presentation, but Victoria has contributed a huge amount to the ACES Hub and this co-production need. So we now have Angela with us and it is an absolute pleasure to invite and introduce her. Angela Kennedy is a consultant clinical psychologist. Many of you will know of her work already, having spearheaded trauma-informed approaches within UK healthcare for some years now. And she's gonna to speak to us about trauma-informed change and the open narrative system. Welcome, Angela. So it's really good to be here again. And yes, as, as Victoria said, I, I was at um, your original hub meeting and it's just a re amazing to see the ACES hub grow, um, you know, over these times, especially um, since we've been through a pandemic, which of course has created a different narrative around adversity and uh, trauma. And I think it's opened up some possibilities for us as well, as well as it having been really heartbreaking for a lot of people. But I have noticed a shift in narrative. And um, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is about the development of an online resource for people who are wanting to make some um, practical implementation around trauma-informed uh, practices in their services. Um, and it's called Open Narrative System because exactly that, you know, this is about the uh, way we frame the problem, it's about the lens, it's about the words that we use. Um, and I think, you know, why, why are trauma-informed approaches important? I know you all know that because you're all here, but not everyone does. I think for me, the essential thing is that it puts the people's lived experience of adversity at the center of our efforts to create both individual and collective well-being by engaging constructively with the complexity of that lived experience. And it is that complexity, the collective effort of dealing with complexity and our kind of whole uh, beings is what really is gonna make a difference here. And of course, there are already models of trauma-informed care out there, really useful ones. So this one comes from the US. They've had a much longer history than we have. And I think this is a really nice one that helps us to uh, remember what we're doing. But I do think it's also very focused on the individual and the symptoms. 
Whereas I think really um, we need to, to think about trauma-informed care as a whole system approach. I am so sorry about the dog in the background. <laughs> I hope it's not as loud for you as it is for me. Just a second. Right, so one of the things that worries me a little bit at the moment about how trauma-informed care is being implemented is that it's not being implemented in a whole system way. If we... Um, this is about appreciating people's difficulties in the context of which they arise, but it has to be empowering people collectively and really harnessing on that compassionate motivation in order to prevent suffering. It needs to address underlying causes and problems and seek to create a culture of cooperation. And if it doesn't do that, then I'm not really sure that what we're creating is a trauma informed system. It's pieces of trauma-informed practice that might be good, but there's something very holistic that we need to keep our eye on here. So what type of problem are we trying to solve? Quite often when we're thinking about service change or implementation of anything, we have a bit of a recipe, a pathway, or a set of guidance. That's a bit like baking a cake. So if you have this, this, and this ingredient, and you do it in this, this, and this order, then you're gonna get the outcome that you want. Unfortunately, I don't think trauma-informed care is like that. It's not even complicated. So it's not even as, as if we get a whole bunch of experts onto it and do a really complicated task. I think it's much more akin to the task of raising a child. It's nuanced, it's relational in nature. And if that's the case, we need a different kind of way of implementing it than what we're used to with the usual kind of transactional and um, kind of project management approach. And one of the things that I think is really important is that, you know, this ladder of engagement that has been around for a long time, but there are different aspects of this that are most appropriate for different bits of the system. It's important we don't just look to collaborate somewhere in the middle and come out with the lowest common denominator. It's important that we have everything from things that are really um, kind of evidence-based, so-called expert-driven to the lived experience, expertise and devolution at the other end and everything in between. This is, this is what's going to create a really rich um, system where everyone is allowed to shine to their best rather than kind of standardising it all to the only few things that we can agree on. So some of you might have been aware, back in early 2019, we, have a, we had a UK summit where some people uh, with lived experience, researchers, practitioners, service managers, chief execs, from across the health and care system came together with examples um, of good practice. And they had to bring an example of good practice to come along. And, um, from those examples of good practice, we produced some implementation guidance. So on learning from that, what was it? What were the factors that were making a difference in helping these things to actually happen? So we came out with a framework um, and it was based on this, this method called open narrative inquiry, which kind of developed for that day, but I've used in lots of other situations since. It's a bit of a hybrid of appreciative inquiry, quality research, Socratic Cafe, World Cafe. Basically, you, 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 um, it's a very rapid way of doing a quality analysis very thoroughly. So you start with a large number of real world examples and you can get the practice guidance out at the end. So that's what we did. And this is the document that you can see there on your right. Um, and you can see people working there. You know, it was really task focused. So what we came out with at the, in the end was um, we had three overarching factors. So attention to the interpersonal um, relationships in the system were important the structural things and the kind of what in the system was important. And then there were some key process issues about the way we deliver things that were also important. 
So those seven factors within that, I'm going to come to in a bit more detail shortly. So this idea of complexity and nuance and relational needs us to move away from implementation that looks like that top bit where we do this, this and this, and then we're going to get to where we need to be. And really looking at the world as a network, a social network. And what I think the social uh, uh, trauma-informed care needs is that social movement for change. Without that, we don't really, we're not really going to have any meaningful implementation. So um, it's a network of bottom up, uh, supported by top kind of level buy-in and everything in between. We need those networks to start to make connections, to grow the network, to grow the ideas. So from that network, if, you, if you're taking that more kind of systemic view to trauma-informed care, what, what grew from that first summit and the practice guidance was that we needed a network, a national network of people to share their good practice. And that's how the Trauma-Informed Care Community of Action um, came into being. And so we set up um, with NHS England's kind of gift, if you like, um, a, a, a platform, a, um, a collaboration platform that enables people to uh, connect with, with each other, post chat, hear about events, share documents. And even though we were kind of hit by COVID quite early on, we've kind of continued to produce good practice guidance and run numerous webinars over that time. We also did an evaluation using SenseMaker and SenseMaker is one of those tools that doesn't look at kind of good and bad, but looks at all the varying ways that stories and good practice can kind of help us to learn in a system. And um, I'm just going to give a few highlights from that. So our community was saying that services are currently too piecemeal for trauma survivors. And that was also um, very closely followed up by services being too medicalized as being some of the key things that they saw as barriers to change. One of the key values um, of the uh, um, community was that it, it promotes compassionate leadership. So without transformational, compassion-focused leadership, it's very difficult then to lead on any um, trauma-informed transformation because you're probably not delivering it the way that it needs to happen. So the strongest adoption of trauma-informed care were uh, inclusion in strategic plans, regulations, inspections, interesting, that I think, and also its use in supporting and supervising staff. So I think the idea is that if it's a must do, then we do it because it makes our job easier. And also if you can support staff to do it and think about their well-being, then that kind of um, culture then gets passed on to other people who might need our help in the range of services that we offer. So um, some of the other indicators, so for example, training is important, but I, what I am seeing is that I think some organizations think that if you do the training, that means you're trauma informed. It certainly doesn't. It may, might mean that you have some more trauma aware staff, but practice is very different. Um, so we need to have uh, start to think about how we embed this in our plans, in our narratives, in the way we engage with staff and in the way that staff support um, services kind of relate to each other. So from that, we also um, developed a, a framework for not exactly evaluating yourself, but for thinking and reflecting as teams and services on those seven factors of implementation working out where you are in the different um, pillars of implementation and which ones most apply to you. So you can then uh, produce an action plan for your, for your service. That's very, very personalized to your service. So the, it was all co-produced. It was used in the methodology that I described earlier. It had, um, didn't just have lived experience involvement, but it was, it was really genuinely co-produced. So you get a kind of traffic light system if you want to use that. Um, 
But some of the uh, principles of it are that a reflexive approach over time is what's going to create um, that kind of thoughtfulness and a learning organisation culture that you do need consensus decision making on what practice points you're, you are going to implement. Um, it builds kind of shared awareness and motivation towards goals and it also assimilates quite diverse narratives as well so you don't all have to agree but you can have a kind of varying routes through it. So from that then um, I had an idea that well wouldn't it be good if the document and everything could be alive in a much more 3D way where people could interact with some kind of website or, or something with these narratives and stories of good practice. And so I, try, I got a Northumbria in, Informatics Department, Wellbeing Informatics Department, Northumbria University, and I tried to explain it and this was my scribble. Thankfully, they did a really good job of um, working out what, I'm, what I meant through this little scribble. And that's what we have now. So the open narrative system is a way of exploring all of these implementation pillars, the practice points that are visible to staff internal to the organization, and also the, the ways that they are visible to the people who come to us for help. It um, captures some examples. And if you want to submit any of your examples, uh, we can send you a link in the chat to, um, to do that. It'd be really good to include some of your examples on the platform. And this is what it looks like. So um, it doesn't look like a kind of typical NHS thing. It's got some, um, it's kind of vaguely colorful. It's quite simple to use. Even I can use it and I'm not very technically um, skilled. Uh, so you've got kind of a drop down menu. You can see um, some videos on there with some stories uh, that have been collected. And it kind of takes you through each of the principles so, so the principle of safety, for example, that falls under the um, process orientated theme. You can see that it talks about psychological safeness as well as physical safety, the balance between those two. And you would be presented with um, a set of service user points and a set of uh, staff um, points. So what would actually be visible if you were doing it? Now, these are, intentionally written at the moment to be very generic. The idea of the roots um, framework is that you get a chance to think about how these apply to your particular service and whether they would be more nuanced. So what, how they would translate into your service and decide to work on them. So you can see that there's specific narratives um, attached to the various um, pillars of implementation. So these are some of them. Uh, there's a very specific one around working with a victim of male rape or looking at um, creating choices in relation to disclosures. So quite a broad range of examples that are captured. Same thing about language. Language is one of the other process pillars. Um, and this was a really interesting one because uh, you you know, there's a big debate about whether or not we have certain diagnoses, um, whether or not we just use formulation. I would argue, though, that that is another um, uh, way of kind of imposing certain models um, of understanding. What we need is to think about using kind of everyday language as far as we can and starting with the person's own narrative and understanding of what, how they've come to be at that point in their life with those uh, distress, that distress that they have. The other process factor was uh, empowerment. Um, and again, it's issues of shared decision making, it's um, feeling that staff feeling that they have autonomy in their role, all of those very evidence-based things that we know make a difference but actually with some um, uh, trauma services or mental health services, it's one of the things that gets lost. You know, those choices when 
we are making the decisions for people and we think we've decided that you should be on this pathway. Those um, subtleties of, of helping people find their own route through that's unique to their needs and the way that they would heal best need to be incorporated into what we offer. Compassionate leadership, I've already mentioned, and Victoria did a, a, a sterling job of describing that well, I think, um, because this is about culture making. Uh, so you can't have a trauma informed approach if your culture is one based on fear and you feel that um, it's very transactional operation, it has to be relational based leadership. And again, this staff and, and uh, service user points for that and lots of examples. So leading forensic unit change, uh, managing implementation of, of TIC with uh, clinical leads. The other, the other factor is that relational, uh, re, the, the value of relation relationships to recovery and healing and growth is vital. That we can't simply uh, deliver therapies or interventions as um, transactions or as something to be prescribed and delivered without paying attention to the relational context in which that occurs. Particularly since most of the traumas that people come to services with are relational in nature. There has to be some relational healing there. And so we need to work out, for example, in services, how we can be more adaptable, agile and trustworthy to people who might have, have had some difficult relational experiences in the past. So how do we become more trustworthy for them? How do we demonstrate that? Because they will be very astute and be able to pick up when we're not. And this isn't about um, us necessarily always doing uh, what people want or whatever. This is about relational repair. So accepting that things will go wrong, we will put our foot in it. Um, we will miss a line and miss a tune sometimes, but that is the nature of human relationships. A trauma-informed approach would take a kind of very um, reparative view. So thinking about, well, how can we make this the best it can be, this relationship as best we can be, saying sorry when we need to. It's those kind of things that make a difference. The other thing is healing interventions. We need not to forget that um, sometimes people do need more than a compassion, compassionate relationships. Sometimes they need very specific and quite skilled interventions. Sometimes they might, might, might come by from psychologists, it might come from yoga therapists uh, to try and be embodied. It might come from um, peer supporters. It might come from um, community artists groups where they're bringing to, uh, kind of communities together. It could be any of those things, but we need not to forget that that need those specialist areas need to form part and parcel of the wider system. And again, the way that we set services up is really important. This one, I think, is one of the most vital ones to a system. Where are, it, where are our integrated care boards uh, and integrated care systems paying attention to the way that we commission services? Are we making sure they're all aligned so there is genuinely no wrong door, that it's easy to navigate through that, that we replace stepped care with matched care so it's properly met at where people are at um, properly delivered where people are at, at a, uh, for as long as they need that care. So the open narrative system, you can send via your examples, I will put that in the, the, that uh, email in the chat for you. Um, and if, you know, we can tell you more about it, you don't, it doesn't need to be complicated, short paragraphs are great, but we, we can also give you a um, a form if you want, if you would rather do it that way. And that's it. What I would encourage you to do is go on the, the system to explore it some more. We are hoping to build some other more specific ones uh, for specific areas that are that are less generic. Um, 
But if you want to know how to get started, I think what the open narrative system will hopefully do is give you a starting point with what has been helpful in the past and how can you draw on that wisdom to give you your starting point, tailor it to yourselves. And what I would say is you have we all have to start somewhere. Um, gone is the <laughs> are the days where we should be just talking about this. We need to start doing something more active and we need to start really systematizing that across the board. And I'm so grateful for you inviting me here for to be part of your movement. Um, it's really um, a privilege. So thank you for that. Thank you, Angela, thank you. We will put the, um, the Word document that people need, the template of the open narrative system into the chat and we're very happy to receive them at London ACES Hub as well. Um, so, you know, however people want to get them in, I'll say a bit more at the end. Okay, thank you all, Angela, Mina, Vittoria, for such food for thought in all your presentations. We're gonna move to Q&A now so if um you guys all want to pop cameras on um and over to derek to see what's in the q a yes yes it's been great listening to the free speakers it's been very powerful um but there's also some powerful questions so the first one i've got here and it's a big one so um it's directed to i'm not sure who they want to answer but it says here and i'm going to read it out clearly right can a system or service really be trauma informed if it is labeling traumatized people with personality disorder or the new euphemism for it, complex emotional needs, the harm of this label is well documented and the label itself can be a source of traumatization, regardless of what kind of care a person receives. The principle of trauma-informed care seem completely at odds with problematizing and pathologizing a person's personality? That's a big question. So who's gonna take that one? I'm happy to take that one. Okay. So I have a very particular view about this. I accept that some people with that label embrace that label and it's been help, a helpful way of understanding their difficulties. However, for me, um, to label someone's problems as being at the core of their self, their personality, I think is such an insult. For me, I think we can't possibly be trauma informed if that's what we're doing. And I, but that is, that is my view. I know there are a range of views on this, but I think it's a quick win. We could drop it easily and start to talk about um, the more nuanced ways that people have uh, it affects their neurobiology, it affects their attachments, it affects, you know, their sense of self. Why do we not talk about those things instead? Um, that is my view, though. Right, that's great. You've covered it all. Um, that's a good answer. I hope that's answered everything. Um, there's another one here from an anonymous Wait, I'm attendee. just wondering, Derek, if anyone else wants to respond to that. Yes. You don't have to, because we haven't got very long for Q&A. I know that, Mina, you just, <laughs> you were kicked out again. And uh, are back with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah can I take from from this? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, go Sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, Victoria. Okay. No, because I see, um, you know, in the chat that people are talking about uh, the IAPT sessions not to be enough. But actually, you know, trauma form approach is not only for IAPT or mental health services is even for the Paul Mall shopping mall, you know, even for the, for, for it's, 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 it's about all of us. It's about having all of us the approach. So it's not limited to GPs or, uh, or uh, 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 nurses. We need to have the whole of London, the whole of UK trauma form, and then things will change. We have a comment in the chat, trauma is everyone's business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah we move to another, yeah, another we'll question? To Mina, you want to take it? Um, which question? Oh, here's another one. one. Move to another question, because I think Mina another, missed that well, here's one. Another one. This other one says, does trauma-informed care include iatronic and socio-political trauma? Yes. 
it should do. And if it doesn't, it's not properly trauma informed. And I think this is where we need to move away from just an individual view of trauma into a more collective community based perspective. And if we do that, we also then move to the solutions being more cultural and community based as well, I think. But yes, absolutely. I think, I think, can I be a little bit challenging? Aces right. for me. <laughs> Is, a, is is slightly fueling that thing about it's about the you know the individual and it, it, this is also about adult traumas it's about cultural traumas it's about the trauma of your parents that because they're struggling with that they then might end up passing some of those anxieties on you know to you this is the reality of how we're all connected and uh, I do think the aces kind of contributes to that difficulty a little bit okay Mina you gonna say something yeah I just wanted to come in on that because um when we're learning about ACEs when I'm uh, kind of having a conversation about ACEs with um people in trauma-informed care training we often talk about the fact that um you know the initial ACEs study was done on uh, I, I believe the sample size was mostly white middle class people in America or, you know, they had, there's a level of, um, you know, the data was a bit skewed. And so the more uh, kind of generational traumas, the more community traumas that may be faced by communities of color, people who have, um, you know, who, who don't have as many privileges, maybe, uh, and that's not to negate anyone's um, trauma in terms of their adverse childhood experiences, but I think there's something around um, the fact that in, as, and it goes into a cultural thing as well, because, you know, in other cultures, in non-Western cultures, it's, it's very, very common to have a very, it takes a village kind of approach to mental health. So um, I actually think we could learn a lot from that and really you know as as someone was saying earlier in the chat you know trauma is everyone's business because I, I think that a collective approach makes a lot more sense um than a more individualized sort of approach okay Victoria you want to share all your, another question we'll go for another the next one Do yeah should that... we go to the question from Anna okay I'll come down to Q Anna Redding okay can Mina speak to the barriers she spoke of so if you, I think you touched it a little bit, but you can go more. So you can just be touched. Yeah, so yeah. some of the barriers that I faced was around, uh, the biggest one was resource thing. So maybe that was what people missed. Um, because, you know, whenever I have an issue that I found to say, I want to have more service users be part of co-production. So it's not just me um, kind of giving my opinions, but rather like a representative um, group of people who, who uh, mirror, you know, the, the population that is, is being served. Um, there's, there's always the response of, we don't have the, the resourcing for it. We can't pay everyone for it. Or um, I, I recently suggested, uh, because often what happens is people are left in the lurch a bit when it comes to um, you know, accessing services. I've been waiting for art therapies for about a year now, and I still have to wait till October. And they said to me, well, okay, we, we, we can call you each month if you feel like you're being left in the lurch a bit just check up on you I suggested that to a team and they said you know Mina that's a great idea but we just don't have the capacity for it at the moment so I think that speaks to the lack of resourcing and the barriers that are, that are faced in trying to make something more trauma-informed in building more of a relationship with people with um, you know clients but then also being constrained because of austerity because of you know um the fact that so much funding is being cut um, because of wage, stagn wage stagnation and things like that. So all of those things are huge barriers that I face and I'm still facing and I'm trying to figure out how to smash through. But um, yeah, so if anyone has any tips on how to <laughs> help with that, short of me becoming prime minister, I don't know what will actually work. But yeah, I also don't know who would vote for me. <laughs> so there's that. But um, yeah, I think those are just some of the things some of the barriers i i think the <laughs> someone just said meet up for pm i wish yeah that would be nice 
anyone would be it, to be honest the bar's really low at the moment so okay. <laughs> well that, that's a good answer thanks for that um we go to there's one i just missed i'm trying to get everyone's question in okay so i'm going to go back to an anonymous attendee and he goes do you think that trc will come with more dx and formulation and form so formulation of harmful personality disorder for adults and children which does not lead to trauma specific care so let's see who's going to go into that one so so the question is do I, sorry do you think that the diagnosis will lead on to more trauma specific care yeah uh, it's it's about um whether actually trauma-informed care might lead to more diagnosis and formulation of personality disorder. I think we've had quite a similar question around that yeah, already, okay. haven't we? So I wonder if we can move to another, because we've probably only Let's got go time for one more question in this section. Um, Tracy Smith has got an interesting and big <laughs> question. Yeah, go ahead. What about that one, Derek? Okay, that's Tracy Smith. Here you go. Any top tips? And this is for anyone, right? Any top tips where to start with transforming a whole trust approach to being trauma informed in line with what has been spoken about. So that's for all three, so. Okay, well, you find out where the good practice is already. Um, you get your chief exec and your board um, to agree that if they scaled that up, that would solve a lot of their problems. And so you you map what you, what what people are trying to do you get tell your board that they've got to do it and to harness that energy and then that's where to start get those people networked get them plugged into their chief exec and the problems it'll solve for their long-term planning okay that's great i think that's that's us um victoria or mini will answer that yeah i mean I um, what I want to say is that don't forget that the NHS long term plan talks about working partnership and the, uh, you know, the integrated care system now, because uh, we can't uh, work as a silos anymore. I mean, mental health services, they can't. They can't really, for many, many, many reasons, they can't be the only ones. That's why the NHS have to come up with this, you know, integrated care system and working in partnership. So, you know, the trauma form again is for everyone to apply it. And then we need to work in partnership, which means, you know, mental health services together with local authorities, together with the education department, together with, you know, with the universities, uh, together with the, you know, uh, third sector organizations. This is the, the, the present and this is the future. So it's all of us working together and we need to spread the message around trauma form. Trauma form, you know, at first, as I said in my talk, can scare people because when we hear the word trauma, it's like, oh my God, it's too complex. But actually it's about the approach. It's about how we approach people. It's about how we approach each other. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you all very much. We're going to move now. We're going to invite all of our guest speakers to have a conversation together around solutions and change. Um, so speakers, where do we go from here? What are the next steps in supporting and mobilizing each other to take action towards the trauma informed and ACE aware system change that we want to see. Perhaps Angela, you'd like to start us off. I agree with Victoria. I think your ICS is probably going to be where you could potentially get some support and buy in for this. And they would have resources to support innovation days where you can showcase the good stuff that is happening. Um, they potentially ha have some influence over the investment for community transformation. 
to make sure that that is trauma informed, that we have adequate trauma specialist services that go beyond PTSD diagnosis, you know, that look at trauma services that are not necessarily in the UK, but further afield in Europe and the US, what, what do they look like and what can we learn from them? I think um, the ICS could be potentially a powerful ally in all of this. Um, but it's that bottom up support, energizing and making sure that those people that are trying to do this on their own at the moment don't burn out. Yeah. Just fan their flames. Yeah. yeah. Build each other up, support each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. It re that yeah, that that's how you create a resilient system yeah. through those networks, through those relationships, through yeah. you know be being a trustee of whatever charity is asking you for help or it's that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean trauma form is also taking care by each other. Lately, you know, um, as I said, I'm doing CQC inspections and peer reviews for the College of Psychiatrists. And what I always say lately is, you know, of course, I'm there to represent the voice of patients and carers. But lately, I, uh, I also say that I'm there to represent the staff because I want to hear among all the questions that I raise to different services. Nowadays, I raise the question around staff well-being. What about staff well-being? Because we cannot expect, you know, uh, a good service if the staff well-being is not considered. And so Trauma Informed is about everyone. And it's, uh, it's our, you know, each of us responsibility to make sure that our, you know, neighbor, cousin, husband, colleague, you know, it's trauma form, and we offer, you know, trauma form approach. So this is what is my... Um, you, you've hit yeah. an important point there, Victoria, because I don't think there's a, a dis such a distinct barrier between staff and our so-called service users as is apparent. You know, staff are also traumatized not just by their work or you know whatever the stresses of work but they are human beings with lives they sometimes need support from services themselves they care for people who use services they've experienced their own traumas inside and outside of work i think by paying attention to that it isn't about putting staff first i think what that will do is it'll break down the them and us narrative that it's these people who need help and these people don't and yeah. these people have no trauma and these people do yeah. that's not the case yeah. um so i th i think it's a really important yeah. starting point that and if we yeah. had more people in services able to talk about their own adversities as yeah. they arrive and those people could be that wouldn't be stigmatized to a, so that they maybe were then not seen as such good candidates for senior positions. Yeah. I think that would also help at the moment, the stigma there. And so we expect peer supporters to tell their stories, but why did we not start with staff? I think it's a bit unfair we didn't start with staff because if it didn't stay for service users, yeah. for staff to tell their trauma stories, how on earth can we say it's, it's uh, safe enough for, for service users. Yeah. Mina, I can see that you're okay. wanting to... Sorry, Mina. Comment. No, no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think for me personally, the, the times when I connected the most with um, a therapist or with a psychologist is when they were being real with me. And when I say that, what I mean is when they're talking to me like another human being rather than as a patient who um you know they need to be all paternalistic over and i think that's the distinction um because you know 
I think the example was when um, I had a therapist, she, she's Catholic, and she, she was raised in a Catholic household, and I was talking about some of my struggles um, in terms of like, you know, coming from a faith background, and often a lot of the sort of values and things like that, and she said, you know, I can't exactly relate to it because I'm not Muslim, but I have something similar in terms of, uh, you know, in my Catholic upbringing, and I said, oh, actually, I went to a Catholic school, so I can kind of, uh, I get what you mean, sort of thing, and we were just talking as equals and I don't mean like as friends necessarily but I do think that if there is an evening of the power imbalance that can make a huge difference and I actually do think that with with COVID we've learned a lot or we should learn anyway about lived experience and the importance of how instructive that can be because we at first didn't know anything about COVID we didn't know how it spread we didn't know um, how it affected us and yeah absolutely studies were part of that but it was also people reporting what their symptoms were people people saying this is uh, a difficulty that I've found this is you know people reporting in real time so I think if we um, really tap into that a bit more we might kind of blur the lines a bit between kind of who's a service user who's a staff member and actually I have been seeing that in some of um, my work that I've been doing you know I work a lot with peer support workers I work with um, other people who have access to services and are quite candid about it but I think that needs to be kind of normalized a bit more um, and that also starts with having more lived experience positions within uh, within NHS trust because at the moment they're mostly kind of part-time they're making a couple of days a week or whatever they're not like full-on positions where you have a sense of responsibility and you feel like an equal to um someone who is a psychologist or someone who is a therapist um in terms of you know respect and i think that's kind of what's missing at the moment yeah i think that those range of um, lived experience roles so which staff have you got with some lived experience that are in roles that happen to be something else um, have you got um, true peer support as well as kind of uh, live peer support workers with lived experience which I think is distinctly different um, still good but distinctly different is your training co-delivered with people with lived experience do you have advocates so people can get justice for the crimes that are being committed against them so that we're not just dealing with this as a health issue because justice can go a long way to, to healing. Um, so it's all of those kind of lived experience uh, narratives that we need to bring in other than this kind of, well, we just employ some part-time band for uh, workers how do you get that embedded those voices embedded throughout the structure of the organization and including in some of the backroom functions you know what, what how does that how does that apply to your IT department it's that kind of thing that I think at the moment the subtlety is a little bit missing from some of the plans but you, we do need to grow um and appoint more lived experience leaders who can um, really help to shape that narrative because, you know, the, or the, those of us not in those positions um, end up then feeling like we're having to kind of have roles that we're not, you know, we're looking after roles that we are not in a position to look after. That should be, why, why do we not have those senior leadership roles? Mm -hmm. So we need so leaders we need, for those leaders as well. Is you what need you're leaders saying. for yeah. those leaders. You need yeah. mentors. You, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, um, we're inviting you all now for some kind of final remarks we could talk about this for hours couldn't we there's so much and the chat is you know there's so much in the chat coming through as well that we'll have a look at afterwards as well lots of good stuff and lots of sharing that's really wonderful to see um, we know that anyone who's attempted system change knows how challenging and complex this can be so can I ask all of you now um, 
in all the work that you've done to date in your different spheres and areas and with the experiences that you bring, what might you do differently if you could go back and do it again? What have you really learned that our audience will hopefully be able to take away wherever they are in their journey? Victoria, do you want mm. to start us off? You know, I've... <laughs> Big well, question. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, since day one, back in 2015, when I, you know, I, I started this mission of mine, from that day to today, I've been challenging and fighting and roaring like a lion. Sometimes, uh, you know, it has been not easy because first of all, I have my Italian culture and, you know, the passion and the hands sometimes, you know, <laughs> they, they are too much. <laughs> so, um, but I'm still here. You know, it's like when, I do CQC inspections, especially, you know, eating disorder wards or children wards. And believe me, there are moments that, you know, the only thing I want to do is just to open that door and leave. But then I ask myself and I say, hang on a minute, why are you doing this? And I always find the same answer. I do this because I want to make a difference out there, no matter what. Mm. I want to be the change. And so that gives me even more fuel. Yes. Be the change we want to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who'd like to answer that next? I could go next. Mm. Um, so for me, if I could go back, the main thing I would say is to question everything. And, you know, don't worry if that sounds like you're trying to wreak havoc or make things difficult, because to an extent, I'm always going to be seen as the person who is who is trying to <laughs> wreak havoc and try but by people who, who want to maintain sort of the, the current state of things, the status quo. Um, but I also think that it's important to consider the fact that nothing is set in stone. Um, one of the things we always try and talk about when, when we uh, discuss trauma-informed care, or we try and explain it to someone who doesn't know much about it, is we try and use this distinction between sort of uh, what, what happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. And actually what we found is that we're kind of refining those questions a bit and we're changing them and it's a reminder that everything within trauma-informed care is is quite organic and it shifts and it changes over time and nothing is really set in stone um so you know now we're asking different questions we're, we're asking what happened rather than what happened to you because that kind of puts this undue focus on on someone and makes them feel a bit spotlighted or vulnerable and if you say what happened, it's a bit, more, a bit more general. But then there's also a second question that we've decided to add, which is what's strong with you? What are your strengths? What are the things that you're good at? What can you lean into when you're, you're struggling? And for me, that has been uh, writing. But, you know, people don't consider these strengths. They just see the problems. They just see the disorders, the things that are going wrong. Uh, mental health problems, um, personality disorder, things like that. But if you look at things from a more positive perspective and you think about strengths in particular, whether that's, um, you know, your faith or it's your identity, maybe it's a community that you're part of, all of these things can um, really be a crucial part of your recovery journey and it doesn't have to be stuck in this uh, clinical room where you know that there's a plant trying to be cheerful but like it, it's like it's not going to be the same thing as if you're like sharing food that you cooked with um you know people that you love or if you're gardening with um a group of a, a group of people that you really connect with so 
I think it's important to consider the fact that nothing is set in stone with trauma-informed care and we always want to keep it evolving and changing for the better um mm. you know as more people come in thank you mina i love that question what's wrong with you yeah angela in in a it's a hard second <laughs> i'm trying to find a way of framing this that doesn't sound too negative i would have been more cautious about my optimism and protected myself more because change can mean that you can get undermined and, and tacked and it can have a personal toll you know the certain mm -hmm. parts of this system is not ready to do this and yeah. when you uh, are seen to be doing something that can be a pushback i would have possibly been a bit more prepared for that than i was yeah thank you thank you for that that personal quite personal response there Re yeah really important I think so I'm I'm really quite sad to say we're coming to the end of our time this evening and thanks so much all of you for joining us for such a, a rich event and enormous gratitude to our speakers for volunteering their time tonight inspiring debate and ideas for action the chat has not stopped um, and we hope the event has inspired you guys at home to submit your trauma informed projects to the open narrative system and the website details are in the chat. The London ACES hub website contains a map of ACES and trauma informed organisations in London and beyond. So if you'd like your organisation to be included on the map, please submit your form to contact at londonaceshub.org and we'll ensure that your form also reaches the open narrative system website. And you can also send it to Divya with the details that Angela put up earlier. Everyone that's attending the evening will receive a certificate, a CPD certificate by email in the coming days. And we're planning many more events for you. So if you want to keep updated with these, then keep an eye on the London ACES Hub website and you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter, News for Action, details also on our website. OK, as soon as the webinar ends, the feedback form will come up on your screens. We really appreciate you taking a couple minutes to fill this out. We are a learning and awareness raising community and we welcome your ideas and suggestions. A big thank you also to my co-facilitator, Derek Williams. And I'm going to pass you over to Tiani and Roger, the London ACES Hub Operational Directors, to close this evening with a celebration. Let me unmute her here. Yes, it's so, so, oh my gosh, I'm so like, woo, this is, this is so exciting. This is so special. Uh, this balance we need uh, between facing reality and keep passionate and believing that we need to do this together because change is possible. Change every day takes place. Uh, and this is, this evening about, and this is what we do uh, through the London Aces Hub, uh, and I'm sure each and every one of you who are here with us this evening do in your lives, in your practice, otherwise you would not be here, let's face it, right? We are, we are all uh, in this journey together, and for this reason, I have a little bit of uh, uh, some celebrations here, right, Roger? And Simon is here as well. We have Leroy Logan, our director as well he's saying his vibes he's committed to change the world somewhere else this evening but he's sending the vibes to us as well and they have let me see if i can do all together here roger do you want to say a few words before i get the the extra bit i have here as well well fantastic um what an amazing event of so many perspectives ah. it's great to be <laughs> to be in touch with just so many people who are passionately interested in the subject um please stay with us um we've got a lot on our agenda we're hoping to set up our london membership scheme and we want to continue the dialogue with everybody out there far and wide um so please follow our news for action bulletin take a look at our website and we'll be in touch with you thank you Yes, and these balloons are here and they have something else. I have a cake and I put it here. Oops, let's see. It's the first year of our existence journey. It is the first year yeah. of our official Fantastic. existence. 
Our land oasis hub became a community interest company last year, and tomorrow, 1st of July, we will celebrate our first year. So here I have a lovely cake with a, a candle, and I invite everybody to blow with us. Let me get my balloons. And, and in this blow, it means that we are going to keep it going and transform our practice, our lives all together as a community. So let's say one, two, three, blow. Yeah, thanks everybody. We love you and let's keep it going together. Support Lovely, us. thank you. Thank Happy birthday, you. London Aces Hub, CIC. Happy birthday. <laughs> See you, everybody. Thanks for our yeah. speakers, our facilitates, for everybody who has been with us today. Let's keep it going, stronger. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Cherney and Roger, for all your hard work.